We'll now continue with the next presentation by Alejandro Acosta. He is IND coordinator at Blacknock and we're speaking about the NAT meter. Welcome, Alejandro. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for some of you. So I'm setting up my presentation. I hope you can see my screen already. Yes, we can. Great. So now let us speak about a topic that I personally am a bit sorry about. The title is Bye Bye Night Nat Meter. And I see a sad face. And if that sad face is myself, and I'll tell you why I have that sad face at this moment. Basically, at this event, we're almost going to say goodbye to Nat Meter. And I'm going to explain what this is all about. I'll give you some history regarding what is happening. So what is what was Nat Meter? So Nat Meter is a project we have at LACNIC, a dear project, at least on my behalf, because we managed to achieve many interesting things. We managed to measure NAT in the end user. And this is what NAT meter is basically about. To do this, well, there is a bit of history here. We had guests who made presentations and we wanted to speak about IPv6 and Internet of Things. And we always heard that NAT breaks the applications, that NAT does not always work in some situations. And when we said, well, if that is the case, let us see really how often things fail because of NAT. So the first step we wanted to see was to determine what the situation was in the rest of the world. So we go into the internet and we see how many NAT is out there in the world, how many NATs in Latin America, and we really didn't manage to obtain this information. <clears throat> I contacted Eduardo or maybe a small university, but nothing formal that would provide information on NAT. So we didn't have that information on all the NATing that was taking place. So that is where we started using NAT meter, measuring this at the browser level. So NAT meter is to detect whether a browser or a user is behind a device that is NATing. That is what this is about. Now, the good news is that we did manage to do this and for many years too. Now, how did we manage to do so? There are several technologies but I feel quite proud of this because we used WebRTC, we used uh, STANS, there were RTC peer connection, there were many servers behind all this, whereby we connected different technologies that made NatMeter a reality for many years. And this is a system that has been referenced in the internet ecosystem also. I won't go into the details, for example, to explain what WebRTC is and what STUN is, but these are the technologies that we used to carry out these measurements. These were included in the browser, the first one, and the second one is if this were a server. And it indicates what, with what IP address this is reaching somewhere someone elsewhere. So those who have worked with IP telephony and with video, the STUN, are, the STUNs are servers to which a client can contact so that they can know what the IP address the user is using. STUN is simple transversal of UDP through NATS. And how does this work? This is very simple. I just have one slide to explain this, but we can basically see that step one is a JavaScript code available in the cloud and in some internet servers. One user is going to obtain that JavaScript code like you have in a website. 
the website then has the JavaScript code. This will be executed by the browser in the background. That script is then executed. It will then talk with the stun servers in order to obtain the IP address that is being used for browsing purposes. And then the data is included in the database servers. This is what we included in the, we write include here what was obtained in the previous steps. So the script and what then was obtained from the different servers. So this is a technical detail. The JavaScript is executed at least twice. You have the command that was used, RTC peer connection. This is executed twice because see, we did a little trick. The trick was if the new RTC peer connection was played twice, you would obtain the IP addresses of the operational system. And we then added, used it for the IPv4 and IP only an IPv6 servers to know which were the addresses used for browsing. And this was the final driver that led LACNIC to carry this out, to make the decision to carry this out. And this was to see if NAT IPv6 existed in the world. There was no technical reason for having NAT in IPv6, but this was a big curiosity that we had. We were most cu curious about this. So we use this and the results were sent to a server uh, for collection and processing. And we used the 1.8 stun version because it could support IPv4 and IPv6. So these are examples of some of the results, percentage of NAT44, percentage of hosts IPv only, percentage of IPv6 only hosts, percentage of dual stack hosts, and this is interesting if there was network prefix translation, which was like NAT in IPv6, so it was amazing the amount of information that could be processed. For example, use of private prefixes, ULAs, as private IPv6 networks, the number of IPv4 addresses in the host, the number of IPv6 addresses in the host. And this is data that we had already shared with you in some of the events. In NAT44, we saw that 95.1% of users were using NAT in IPv4. In the case of NAT66, we saw that we couldn't obtain IPv6 only host, but the estimation between the V6 only host, the percentage was very low. Dual stack host, 22.5%. This is a bit old, this information, but this coincided with the statistics in the region and the IPv6 penetration statistics in the world. MPT usage was 0%. But we saw that there was a lot of information. These are examples of NAT66. These are the IP addresses. We see this uh, private address. So this was doing NATing when exiting the internet. So we saw that there were people with IPv6 that were being NATed to IPv6. And regarding the IPv4 world, even more, we have private IPv4 addresses that came up. And these were being natted with public IXPs addresses. This is a host that had three IPv4 addresses. So these are the types of statistics that we could obtain. Regarding the NAT66 world, we saw some cool things. Yula, Yule uses NAT66. Yule is similar to a private IPv4. 
And if tomorrow this prefix is assigned to a network, these people won't have a connectivity towards that destination. And we saw some interesting cases, private NAT, private IPv6 was one where the person was being knighted. So these are some of the interesting points we saw. Now, why goodbye to NAT meter? And this is a takeaway message that I have for you. Here we see, well, the colors represent the operating systems. We based ourselves on Chrome because it was the one that was most used for accessing the websites that we analyzed. The blue dots correspond to successful measurements, depending on the version of the OS. By December 2019, the amount of successful measurements dropped considerably. It continued over time, and by mid-2020, the measurements were even lower. And successful experiments were only very few ones, less than 1% successful experiments for such an interesting project. So this has became almost irrelevant, measuring 0.1% of successful measurements is very, very little. Now, why did this happen? Why did we have less successful measurements? The thing is that in the Chrome updates, 77, 8, 79, 80, 81 in the server, they were including mechanisms to avoid that these measurements would be carried out because this was an access to privilege. This started to be banned. And of course, that was minimum for Saho. So with those Chrome updates over time, our measurements stopped being satisfactory. So because of that, the conclusion is that for the time being, we could no longer measure that in the way we're doing so. And if any of you has a good idea that we try, can try to implement, then we're open to hearing this from you. Of course, there can be some ways of doing so, but you need to, for example, you open a website and you say yes to the authorizations, but maybe this would not be scalable and we're interested in obtaining a large amount of data. We need to have precise information. This is what we're interested in obtaining, but we're open to hearing ideas from you. I'm going to skip this slide, but what we're saying was, this is how we capture the data and geolocation the way we're doing it, the source code and things that are being, are being carried out. And this is what I have to share with you, Jorge. Thank you, Alejandro. Now we will wait a couple of seconds to see if there are any questions. Jorge, any questions in the Q&A panel? Yes, there is a comment here from Hugo Salgado. Hugo Salgado says there is quite a lot of tension between privacy and allowing some kind of telemetry for network administration. I think it is good to protect the user's privacy and to prevent attacks, but we also have to work in parallel to allow investigation and analysis. We have to respect privacy. This is a balance we have to strike, but we really have to really consider it an interesting challenge of what is happening in the DNS world. Yes, Hugo. You are perfectly right. Hugo is quite clear as to this. He has experienced this situation because he has conducted many DNS studies, but we have been doing those measurements and we admit that Chrome is right. This is somehow in interfering with the privacy. And I see the number of uh, in in uh, where in Linux it worked and in others it worked and I tried in Macs and it worked and certainly there was a sort of uh, attack to pro privacy that was quite high. That's it. Uh, it's the reality. Uh, if you have any ideas, 
any silver bullets that would be appreciated.